بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین الرحمن الرحیم مالک یوم دین ایا کا نابود و ایا کا نستعین ایہ دین سرات المستقیم سرات اللہ دین آنمت علیہم غیر المغدوب علیہم ولد دولین آمین صدق اللہ العظیم On behalf of CIF IBA I welcome all of you for this third session of the day third session of World Islamic Finance Forum and uh, just to let you know that we'll start this session where we broke before lunch. Before lunch, we had three of our papers presented by the learned scholars. And uh, in total, we have five papers which will be presented today. So next two papers will be presented in this session. And uh, I would request, I would again request our honorable Dr. Professor Abbas Mirakhor to please chair this session, join us on the stage. We have uh, two research papers which will be presented. The first paper titled, Does Innovation in Sukuk Structure Creates Value? A study of post-crisis Sukuk wealth effects in Malaysia. And this will be presented by Ziad Muhammad. He's an Islamic Finance Institute of South Asia. I welcome him to the stage, please. The second paper will be presented by Kalsadafor Sayyid Tajuddin, who is a PhD candidate at INSEEF Malaysia. And the title is Sukuk for the Financing of Non-Revenue Water Management, Malaysia as a case, case Study. I welcome Kalsadafor Sayyid Tajuddin on the stage. And uh, as done before, the mic is over to you, sir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I hope you had a nice lunch break and, and, uh, and we're, managed, we're able to do your salat as well. I welcome you to this session, two of my favorite people. Uh, Dr. Ziad bin Muhammad just, Ziyad, just finished his uh, PhD, so I have a right to call him doctor. And uh, Sayyida is also a, a, a wonderful human being. I had a privilege of having her in one course with me of the Quran and the economy, and she did very well. So to save time, I just quickly turn uh, the floor over uh, to Dr. Ziad to present his paper. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Ma ba'd. Jazakumullah khairu. Thank you very much, dearest Professor Abbas, for the honor. We only have about 10 minutes for presentation. Am I right? So I'm going to get into it very quickly. The topic is called... Does innovation in Sukuk structure create value? So it's a study of post-crisis Sukuk wealth effects, specifically in Malaysia. Now, there's a lot of content on the slides. And I'm co of course, if you have the papers, you'd see that, as in any research paper, there's a fair bit of methodology, and there's a lot of findings and literature review. But I'm going to try and simplify it for you quickly in 10 minutes so that you get the crux of the findings and what the objectives were. So ultimately, we want to answer two questions. The first question is, does innovation in Sukuk structure create or enhance firm value? You've got the first one. Does innovation in Sukuk structure, in Sukuk, actually increase or enhance shareholder value or firm value? And the second question is, we want to determine whether you can interpret the issue of optimal capital structure when comparing it to Sukuk issuance. And I'll explain that as we go along very quickly. So in order to achieve the objectives and answer the research questions, we've looked at the literature from four angles. 
One, we've compared Sukuk with conventional bonds. Then we've looked at the announcement effects comparison between conventional and Sukuk. And then we've looked at the underlying structure according to the IOFI and the Sharia Advisory Council resolutions of Bank Negara Malaysia. And finally, we've looked at the literature of Sukuk and optimal capital structure. So we come to the issue of conventional bonds because that's our frame of reference, unfortunately. It's our frame of reference for determining whether Sukuk create value or not. Now, the literature on conventional bonds indicate that if you lump all types of conventional bonds together and you want to investigate where the shareholder value increases, you will be pretty much confused because the results are inconclusive. But when you separate the bonds into debt-based pure debt straight bonds and convertible debt bonds, convertible equity bonds, now you will find a clearer result. For pure straight bonds, there isn't any serious market impact, meaning the market perception of a straight bond issuance is neutral, no impact. But when it is a convertible bond announcement, then you will see a negative impact on share price. That's what the literature indicates. Now, interestingly, Sukuk have been tested before in previous studies, and there are only 11 studies on Sukuk wealth effects. They've been tested as one type of Sukuk, except for a paper or two on individual contracts. No one actually tests whether debt-based Sukuk will provide the same results as equity-based Sukuk. So if we look at it, Debt-based suku can be classified based on the underlying structure, the underlying contract. Murabaha, ijara, salam, istisna, that would be your debt-based suku. But mudarawa and musharaka, on the other hand, and wakala and al-istismar will all fall under your equity-based suku. So all we did was we determined whether those types of suku, the two categories, debt and equity-based suku, will create different firm value post-crisis. Now, unfortunately, when you look at the previous literature, there are certain issues that were not addressed particularly. Now, those research gaps actually hanker around the crisis period. You know the financial crisis? You'd find that Sukuk wealth effect studies go past the financial crisis as if it didn't occur. Now, naturally, we know that investors change behavior when it comes to financial crisis. Immediately, they move towards or they prefer liquidity, and there's a liquidity risk premium. But that's not tested in previous studies. So we decided that we'll demarcate or determine that crisis period and test only after crisis period. So we test within a consistent time period. Then we found that research does not look at Sukuk type. And then research focuses on Malaysia or multi-country studies that provide a result based on the Sukuk market as a whole. Now that can be quite confusing because every economy, every market reacts differently to different issuances. Markets like Malaysia would react differently or incorporate news maybe semi-efficiently as compared to the US or the UK. So lumping all countries together and providing a Sukuk market wealth effect might not be that accurate. And then the crisis periods for those that did consider it actually did not consider the same crisis periods. Some said 2008, 2009. Others said 2009, 2010. We were safe. We went from 2011 to 2015. And then we filtered through with the data because other research tends to use tranches, you know, Sukuk tranches rather than Sukuk programs. And that can be quite problematic because there's a dilution factor. When the tranche is issued, the investor already knows that the program has been announced two years ago. So naturally, the share price is not affected as much. We've looked at programs when the first announcement was introduced into the market. We've got 24 listed companies, 24 Sukuk events over five years. We've used standard event study methodology, the market model, Sharpe's market model, but with a twist. We've applied the Scholes and Williams adjustment for non-synchronous trading in Malaysia. 
We've also applied a fairly new Colari Pinanen cross-correlation adjustment, just to ensure that our data is as robust as possible. And then we calculated for abnormal returns. That was for the first research question, and you'd remember that's about the announcement effect on shareholder value. And the second issue, optimal capital structure, was very easy. All we did was we physically analyzed corporate issuers' financial statements to determine how they disclose it in their accounting, in their financial statements. And I'll give you the results just now. So we have abnormal returns for the debt-based sukuk and equity-based sukuk. Instead of running through those numbers, I'm going to show you a picture. It's much easier to read it off a picture. If you look at the picture, you realize that we're depicting three types here. Obviously, it's the debt-based sukuk, which is what you see in the yellow. The gray is the equity-based sukuk. And in red, it's the total sample. Now, the results are quite surprising because we conducted a test prior to the crisis as well. And we found that in Malaysia, markets respond differently to debt-based and equity-based sukuk. For debt-based sukuk, they react positively. But for equity-based sukuk, they react negatively, very similar to your convertible bond versus your straight bond. But post-crisis, things change drastically. There's no net impact, not for debt-based sukuk, not for equity-based sukuk. So what's happened? And we're going to look at that. The market now considers all sukuk issued in Malaysia, irrespective of the underlying structure, as they would perceive straight, pure debt bonds. And that is quite a different perception to what was prior to the crisis, which means that from all the literature previously that claims that sukuk are innovative structures that are a separate asset class, well, the market doesn't perceive it as such. So post-crisis in Malaysia, the market now sees it as a debt, simply as a debt. So what's happened? What happened? Was it the crisis that influenced it, perhaps? Perhaps investors have become more conservative after crisis, so now they look at a debt issuance without much excitement, so they don't react. But we're suggesting there's another reason for that. We've tested Saudi Arabia, and of course, that's not in the paper, but the results are very different. So we suggest that Sheikh Osmani's statements in 2007 and the subsequent IOFI resolutions of 2008 had an impact on the Malaysian market as well. Although Malaysia likes to see itself governed by the Bank Negara Malaysia uh, Sharia Advisory Resolutions, SAC Resolutions, who were consistent in their approach. They didn't change their approach after Mufti Taqi's statements. You see, Mufti Taqi stated 85% of sukuk are impermissible. I know that you, I'm sure that you know of the statement. But then the market changed in the Middle East. Equity-based sukuk became more equity-based. But in Malaysia, nothing changed. So this is not a Sharia paper. This is a market perception paper, market behavior. And the market says, it seems, that look, you haven't changed the way you do business in terms of your sukuk issuance, so we will not recognize it anything more than a debt. So we're suggesting and we're recommending that potential policy change be considered. We're not debating the issue of Sharia compliance and saying that Malaysian sukuk are not Sharia compliant. We're saying the market perceives it as not Sharia compliant, and that's a big difference. For the second finding, it's also quite pertinent because previous researchers assumed that when a company issues a debt-based sukuk, then that will increase the debt side of a leverage calculation. But when they issue an equity-based sukuk, it will increase the equity side. That means reduce overall leverage. But when we analyze the books of the issuers, there's no difference between debt and equity-based sukuk. They account for it in exactly the same way, as a debt, as a liability. So in a leverage calculation, irrespective of debt or equity-based sukuk, they are always accounted for as debt. So if you're considering optimal capital structure studies, then you have to consider the fact that all sukuk, irrespective of the type, are currently all accounted for as debt in the financial statements of corporates. So how can you actually look towards a conclusion of optimal capital structure then, if they're all debt. 
Of course, this is supported by our previous findings because you saw no net wealth effect. It's treated as a debt in the accounting statements and it's perceived as a debt by the market, by the investors. So there are issues in terms of negative uh, connotations, in terms of perception, but there's also a positive. For those corporates that are not uh, sensitive or are indifferent towards Sharia, we have many corporates that are not Sharia compliant corporates. They want to raise funds using alternative instruments. So they would probably be more attracted to a sukuk issuance because they have tax incentives from Malaysia. They are regarded or they regard them as some exotic structures and different to the norm. And of course, Malaysia promotes the issuance of sukuk. So there are a number of advantages issuing sukuk in Malaysia. But we're saying it's not the traditional Sharia compliance that you might have perceived. So in summary, is market reaction to post-crisis sukuk announcement affected by underlying structure? You know, those exotic structures you see. Does it make an investor more excited and share prices go up? We're saying no. The results say no. Does the market perceive sukuk to be a separate asset class in Malaysia? Post-crisis, unfortunately, no. Are sukuk disclosed according to the underlying structure? No. So that's an interesting finding as well. So we suggest that when you look at financial innovation, and we know that this forum, this conference is about financial innovation, the clamor towards financial innovation cannot be an end in itself. Because we all admit that sukuk exotic structures are so amazing in terms of the underlying structures and how they put them together. We have vaccination sukuk, we have green sukuk, we have future SRI sukuk about to be released. But financial innovation is not an end in itself. Only when it increases firm value, now it is value adding. Before that, what did you achieve? Except perhaps extending the parameters, moving towards the Sharia parameters or beyond them, that's what you've done. Yes, the advantage is you've increased the options in the Islamic capital market, but overall, have you increased shareholder value? The results say you have not. That is the summary of the paper. Uh, we could delve into a whole lot of detail, uh, however the time does not permit. And of course, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much, Dr. Ziad. Very interesting paper. I hope that we have some few minutes for questions later, not now. But uh, please, um, just to follow the instruction of Dr. Ishrat, um, I think it's, this is the policy implication from this paper really relates to SAC. Uh, as it turns out, uh, opposite to what we had this morning by Dr. Saad saying that borrowers are naive, investors appear not to be naive. They seem to be quite informed, be able to differentiate uh, a truly Islamic sukuk versus, a, uh, versus one that is only apparently Islamic sukuk. Uh, basically because probably the, the investor knows that these are all um, basically benchmarked to interest rate. So uh, I don't know who's taking notes for, for tomorrow for conclusion of this, this uh, session. So Dr. Ziad's paper is quite important in terms of finding uh, that basically uh, investors are smart enough to differentiate between the real and the apparent one. Thank you very much. Now uh, we turn the floor to Sayeda, please. Thank you, Prof. Salamu alaikum. Benjamin Franklin once said, when the wells dry up, we learn the worth of water. Do we value our water resources? Can our water dry up? When we look at our beautiful blue planet, we assume that water is in abundance because 70% of our uh, of the planet is covered with it. But in reality, only 1% of this water can be consumed and used for irrigation purposes. 
And currently, 1.6 billion people live in countries and regions that are in absolute uh, water scarcity. And the number is expected to increase to 2.8 billion by 2025. Now, a study by the World Resources Institute uh, listed 33 top water stress countries in the world. And 78% of the countries are Muslim countries, Pakistan being one of them. Overconsumption, increasing demands for water, and extreme droughts have caused many rivers um, and lakes to dry up. And it's a common trend that rising temperatures and extreme droughts are happening in these places. So climate change is an important factor. And world leaders are taking note, uh, as it was witnessed at the UN uh, Climate Change Conference in Paris last year. The World Economic Forum's uh, Global Risk 2015 report stated that global water crises are the next um, uh, biggest threat facing the planet over the next decade. And for the first time, uh, water was placed at the top as the most impactful risk to economies, environments, and people. So with all this happening around the world, you would think that water would be valued and conserved, right? Well, not quite. 32 billion cubic meters of treated water is lost around the world each year through leaks in pipes. Now, if you only reduce this by half, you can serve 90 million people and actually gain 2.9 billion without the necessity to build more dams. Now, the main reason for these leaks is the aging infrastructure. Thames Water, in a utility in London, has spent around um, 11 billion pounds so far, and they will be spending more. In the US, uh, it, uh, you need around 91 billion to maintain and upgrade their water systems, but they only got funding for 36 billion. So there is a financing gap. Traditionally, funding for these water systems comes from the three Ts, which is tariffs, we as consumers pay uh, for the services rendered, and taxes, as taxpayers, we also pay for these infrastructure improvements, and third, transfers, which is assistance from other countries and organizations. But these are not enough uh, for the industry. So we need private funding to bridge this financing gap. A common terminology uh, for the water that is lost is non-revenue water. So water can be lost through physical leaks, through pipes, or through um, water theft, or, uh, or when you don't install meters to build the customers. Now, why are these leaks not repaired? Most of the expenditure is concentrated on meeting increasing water demand. So people, uh, governments tend to build more dams and uh, water tunnels or aqueducts. So operational budget is reduced for maintenance. So the NRW increases and revenue decreases and operational costs increases. Another reason for this is uh, full value of water is not recognized. The tariffs are low and the water operators are not self-sufficient. And the indirect benefits to health, economic growth, and environmental quality are not recognized. I found this article published in the Express Tribune in May this year. The Pakistan Council of Research in Water Resources has warned that the country will approach absolute water scarcity by 2025 if measures are not taken. The NRW in Pakistan ranges from 30 to 60 percent. And an, an interesting point is that um, in Islamabad, there are no meters installed. So that means when a household which has um, probably maybe six bathrooms and a swimming pool pays the same rate as another household with just one bathroom. The reasons cited for this NRW is water theft, aging infrastructure, and system leakage. Malaysia is not considered a water stress country. 
The rainfall in 2014 was at uh, 951 million cubic meters, and the consumption of treated water only 3.7 cubic meters. But ironically, we had a water crisis that year. Companies like Nestle suffered 15 million ringgit in losses every day for the two months of crisis. The water crisis occurred again this year in April. So as you can see here, this is the uh, Bukit Merah Dam in uh, Perak, which became completely dry. The months-long heat wave uh, was attributed to El Nino. The heat waves are becoming longer and hotter. So every time when it stops raining, our dams run dry and water is rationed. Our NRW is at 38% uh, at average, and it can reach to 56% in some states. So in this study, the approach used was to convert the NRW into financial values and deduct it with the cost of the repair co repairing the leaks. So the main objective is to provide evidence that repairing the leaks and saving the amount of water which is lost makes financial sense. The results indicated the additional water saved after deducting the repair was at uh, 2.1 billion for the year 2014. And the cost was only 286 million. So by reducing these losses, water can be supplied to 26.8 mil million people without extracting more water and without stressing the water sources. In the case of Pakistan, more emphasis should be on the installing of the water meters. Green bonds have emerged as a new form of um, environmental financing and has risen rapidly to 37 billion issuance in 2014 with uh, issuers even from the World Bank. Now, green sukuks have um, gained momentum with the issuance mostly in renewable uh, energy uh, sectors, but not in the water sector. In the Malaysian sector, the main players are the National Water Services Commission, which is SPAN, the State Water Corporation, and the State Water Regulators, and PAB, the National Water Asset Holding Company. So this is the proposed structure, a Wakala Ijara Sukuk structure. So the PAB incorporates uh, an SPV. The SPV issues the sukuk with water rights as the underlying asset. SPAN is declared as a guarantor. As a wakala agreement, the SPV hires the water operators as a wakil to undertake the oversight of the NRW contractors. Um, the Ijara agreement, the SPV hires the contractors to perform the NRW work. The water operators collect all the revenue gained from the NRW loss reduction and pay PAB. PAB collects the certain percentage for the water rights and then transfers the remainder of the revenue to the SPV, who in turn pays the investors. As a conclusion, water scarcity is something that will be faced by most countries and conserving and uh, reducing the losses is something all utilities can do with the proper uh, teams, dedicated teams, and financing. Another important point of the study is to show that investing in sustainability is profitable, and Suku can provide the financing solution for NRW globally. We can venture into green financing. So I'd like to end my presentation with a question. What would we do if our water dries up. We take for granted what is most valuable and only regret it once we have lost it. So let us value our water resources and strive to stop the wastage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sayeda, for a very important paper. Um, unfortunately, wake up calls uh, are either not paid attention to or paid attention to, but too late. The fact that uh, Pakistan is going to be water scarce 
society by 2025 should be a warning call. And the paper, of course, um, points to a very important issue. There is a theory out there now that wars are caused by lack of water, especially in the Middle East. Uh, specifically, the, the, this theory mentions as an example uh, the war in Syria. Uh, argue, they argue that basically C the war in Syria is caused by lack of water. Uh, the neighbors especially are, are invested in trying to make the Syrian society so fragmented so that that would allow them to use, take, up, take uh, advantage of the situation and use the water resources of Syria. The policy implications from the presentation here is obviously the two very important ones. First is that there is no resources enough uh, at the national level to be able to address the problem. So she suggests uh, appropriately that the private sector has to be tapped in order to raise enough resources. And she has a very innovative and very imaginative uh, instrument that has been proposed. I certainly hope the uh, government of Pakistan takes that seriously and, and begin thinking in those terms. And secondly, she believes that obviously this particularly precious resource is not priced correctly in Pakistan and suggests that uh, by installation of, of uh, meters that um, perhaps this could, be, um, this, could, this could be mitigated. But having been in Pakistan for so long and knowing the problems of public organizations that deal with electricity like WAPTA, uh, when I read about WAPTA today, it has exactly the same problems it had 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So it has been an intractable problem from a from public policy issue. Um, so I'm hoping that, uh, inshallah, this paper would, would um, provide some way of, of new thinking for saving this precious resource so that 2025 will not create a water shortage problem here. Thank you very much for both of you. There is some time now that we can available to us that we can perhaps devote to questions and answers. Um, if there are any questions to the two speakers, I'd, I'd be glad to take them forward. Any questions on either of the papers? I guess they were very obvious. Thank you very much. And thank you all for listening. Thank you very much.